Raj Ankilach on Moogle 10. Uh, the title of this next session is called The Future of New Writing, and our session sponsors are Amity University. Uh, here we have with us Charmaine Craig, Jitayel, Joshua Ferris, Nadifa Mohammed, and Rabi El Madin in conversation with Amitav Kumar. I'll hand you over to Amitav. Please welcome our speakers. For those who are disappointed that John Freeman is not here, he was supposed to chair this session. Just try to imagine someone more handsome than me and a bit more cleverer. So I said yes to this because the lineup was so excellent that I knew I didn't have to do any work. I'm myself very curious about what is the future of new writing and indeed what is new writing. So without any further ado, I'll ask questions of people to, to you know, I'll introduce one person. They can say something, and then I introduce the next person. Does that work for you guys? Sure. So the first person on our list, the way it was presented, was Charmaine Craig. Charmaine Craig is the author of the novels Miss Burma, long listed for the National Book Award in 2017, and The Good Men. She's a faculty member in fiction at the University of California at Riverside, a graduate of Harvard University, and the descendant of significant figures in Burma's modern history. So, Charmaine. What's new writing? What's the future of new oh, no. writing? Mm, I have to start. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, maybe I'll start with a little bit of a voice of dissent. I don't, I don't really believe in innovation in writing. Um, or in, I mean, the novel itself, I, I'm a novelist, so I'll, I'll, I'll frame this in terms of the novel. But I, for me, the novel is such an elastic form that is always responding to its subject or yielding to its subject that I, I um, I don't really believe that we should be writing in the mindset of always being innovative, it, structurally. Uh, I do see a trend in, in, in quote unquote new writing um, toward auto fiction. And I think that comes out of social media and the culture of likes. And so if anything in my writing, I, I perhaps I'm a bit more old fashioned. I prefer the, uh, the modest form of third person which um, in which the narrator is hiding, is more latent, um, and uh, and is is and and what is featured is um, the empathic effort on the part of the writer and of readers uh, in embodying the consciousness of another. So I think the best new writing for me often is uh, a lovely response to the the um, the spirit of ideologies of our time. Um, maybe that's, I'm touching on a lot that's, of things. That's beautiful. But. Thank you so much. Uh, the next one on my list is Jeet Thail, who looks remarkably coherent despite the amount of wine we drank last, no, yeah, no, not last night. Last night was dry. Um, <laughs> Jeet Thail. We're going to be in big trouble now. Really, you know I, this is Jaipur. I right? corrected myself, boss. He, he meant the night before. The night before. The year before. Jeet Thail worked as a journalist for 23 years before writing his first novel. How do you pronounce it? Nakopolis. yes, yes. His five poetry collections include These Errors Are Correct, which won the 2013 Sahitya Academy Award. Narcopolis was awarded the DSC Prize for South Asian Literature and shortlisted for five other prizes, including the Man Booker Prize. The Book of Chocolate Saints, which is fantastic, is a second novel just out. Jit. Thank you. Thanks, Amitav. Um, I, you know, uh, I mean, the, the word in the title that gets my attention is future. I, I wouldn't, my question is not, is there a future, or what is the future of new writing? The question is, is there a future? Wow. You know, and I'll quote Leonard Cohen, who said, I've seen the future and it's murder. Uh, that seems incredibly visionary at this moment in our, mm -hmm. uh, in our age. Um, Taking off from what Charmin said, you know, uh, there's a reason a novel is called a novel. It's because it is the, the literary form that is constantly open to innovation. It is capacious. It is inclusive. It can take anything you throw at it. It can include poetry. It can include Ulysses. James Joyce did this a hundred years ago. You can, you can use anything in a novel, and it... Uh, it adapts itself around it like the English language. Uh, so 
uh, when people like Naipaul, for example, tell you that the novel is dead, you mustn't believe it. He's saying that uh, because he's got a book to sell and it grabs a few headlines. The novel is not dead. The future is fine, at least when it comes to literature. For us and for the world, it's a whole other story. Thank you. To my immediate left is Joshua Ferris. For many people in America, they think his middle name is New Writing. So I'm very excited to hear your thoughts on this. Let me do the intro here. Joshua Ferris is the best-selling author of Then We Came to the End, The Unnamed, and To Rise Again at a Decent Hour. He's been a finalist for the National Book Award, shortlisted for the Ben Booker Prize, and winner of the International Dylan Thomas Prize. He was named one of the New Yorker's 20 under 40 writers in 2010. Joshua? Thank you, sir. Sir? Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to say it. I, I think most novels suck. Most new novels suck. Um, I do a lot of reading of them, and I find myself unconvinced and underwhelmed. So I don't know. I, yeah. I would have to say that I, I disagree with Jeet a little bit, because I do actually think that the novel is dying. I think that most people have to admit that you're addicted to your phones. Um, I, I, when I, you know, when I ride the subway in New York, all I see are people on their phones. I don't see people carrying books anymore. Um, I think that the novel has come under extraordinary competition in 2016 and 2017 in that you could pick up your phone and read about the Donald Trump administration and get the most interesting novel written um, in maybe our lifetime. So I think that real life has started to compete in both formal and uh, ways of content with the novel that make it extremely difficult for the novel to keep up. Um, I would echo with what Charmaine said. There is a certain novel that tends to be um, autobiographical, or as she called it, autofiction, that does seem to have grabbed uh, the headlines, to whatever extent fiction makes the headlines. Um, this also seems to be a kind of trend toward um, insularity that I think bodes poorly for the novel. Mm -hmm. um, but I really don't know how the novel competes with the iPhone. I don't know how the novel competes with some of the technological innovations that have completely seduced um, the people around me and, quite frankly, me too. I mean, I have yeah. to make, take extraordinary efforts to set aside what can be a very insular and um, mean existence vis-a-vis -vis me and my phone and recognize that almost none of those um, aspects, technological or content-wise, really reflect my better self. And it's a hard thing to do, but I think the novel is going to have to, it's going to have to rise to the occasion and be an awfully mighty force. Thank you. All of these folks are making very interesting points which we'll come back to. I just want to collect some initial comments on new writing, future, etc. Okay, how do you pronounce the last name, bro? Gage. Yeah. Uh, next panelist, is Kaya Genj. He's a novelist and essayist from Istanbul. He's the author of Under the Shadow and an Istanbul anthology, Travel Writing Through the Ages. His writing was picked up by The Atlantic for the magazine's Best Works of Journalism in 2014 list, and Genj's writing has appeared in the New York Review of Books, London Review of Books, The Times Literary Supplement, and Paris Review, Believer, The Guardian, The Financial Times, and The New York Times. So, Kaya? Yes, I was uh, at the airport. I saw these stacks of books by Michael Wolf, uh, Fire and Fury. Yeah. And people wanted to have it in hardcover, and people wanted to read it uh, during their flight. And it, was, it almost seemed like a novel to me, because the reality became so fictional. Yeah. Tell, the, tell the folks what that book is. Uh, uh, the book is, about, is an account of uh, White House. and. Uh, told through the perspective of Donald Trump's closest uh, associates. And people, I think, look at reality and see that there are so many fictional elements to it. And so nonfiction has turned into a form of novel, uh, I think. It's, it's not a very good book. It's not very well written. But um, I'm a big fan of Catherine Boo, for example, and her book, uh, Behind the Beautiful Forevers, which was about Mumbai and 
that city's uh, life depicted in a Dickensian uh, scope. And when I read it, I remember thinking, this is a novel and this is something that must be so difficult to write, but is so exciting to read. And that was one of the books that really changed my ideas about the form of the novel and where it can go. And I don't think all writers can master that form, the kind of uh, the nonfiction novel. But I think that's an interesting uh, direction that the novel is heading towards. Beautiful. And now, to my extreme left, is Nadifa Mohammed. She was born in Hargeisa in 1981. Her first novel, Black Mamba Boy, won the Betty Trask Prize, was shortlisted, was longlisted for the Orange Prize and shortlisted for the Guardian First Book Award, the John Ledwin Rees Prize, the Dylan Thomas Prize, and the Penn Open Book Award. In 2013, she was selected as one of Granter's best of young British novelists. Her second novel, The Orchard of Lost Souls, won a Somerset Mom Prize, and the pre Albert Bernard was longlisted for the Dylan Thomas Prize and shortlisted for the Hurston Wright Legacy Award. In 2017, she was selected as one of Freeman Journal's Future of New Writing. So I think the whole burden of this panel is on falls on Nadifa's <laughs> strong shoulders. She has to explain it all. Ah, um, well, I agree with everything that everyone has said. So um, <laughs> I, I'm writing a book, and I'm very aware of actually how much the present situation, the present fears um, have impacted my ability to respond in any kind of measured way. And the only way that I can respond in a measured way is through fiction. Um, I'm constantly enraged by, by the news, by various kind of atrocities, so the only way I can really do that, um, really kind of calm, calm myself and um, contribute anything meaningful is through research. So my style of new writing, and it's not new at all, is non-fiction writing. Yes. I'm working on a book about a murder case from the 1950s, A Miscarriage of Justice. And I intended it to be a very short and tight novel, but it's, it's now almost 600 pages long. And I think I've just been <coughs> getting deeper and deeper into trying to understand the things that people are talking about constantly, you know, discrimination, justice, migration, um, people's self-identity, how they, they, they want to define themselves. So I think that the novel is still precious for that. There's no other way that I, I know that you, you sit with someone or sit with a story for days and days and really absorb it. And um, I'm, I'm not convinced that it has much of a uh, transformative effect on the reader, but it just, it just grabs um, a more meaningful attention from them than anything else that I can think of. Beautiful. I apologize to the audience that there is no new writing in my introductions. I just cribbed the catalog pages for whatever was written about our panelists. Last but not least, oh, is my least. friend. Last but most is Rabi al -Madin. He told me in the car today that this is the last literary festival he's doing. So, <laughs> friends in Jaipur, this is a very special occasion. This is the farewell tour. <laughs> this is <the> last. <laughs> All right. Rabi al Madin is the author of the novels Kool Aid and I, the Divine, the Hakavati, awarded the Rome Prize for Best International Book, An Unnecessary Woman, winner of the Pre Femina Etranger and finalist for the National Book Award, the Story Collection, The Perv, and most recently, The Angel of History, which won the Lambda Prize. Rabi, baby. Yes. Uh, I don't have any much to add. Uh, my, my big thing was, you know, why was I put on a new fiction panel? Uh, I am 58 years old. <laughs> I have six books. What's new about me? Then I started thinking, well, it's better than being on an old and tired fiction. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, the, important, the only thing that I want to add, and I probably just uh, uh, expand on what people are saying, is that we, we think the novel is dead if we look at uh, the novel in a very, uh, with, with very strict eyes. But the novel, for me, 
is a lot bigger than what people think it is. Uh, whether it's Catherine Booth's uh, book or uh, Alexeyevich's book, uh, most nonfiction for me I actually can read as novels. Most poetry for me are very, is very similar to novels. Uh, the, inter the interaction between, for me, painting and what I write, there's not that much difference. Uh, so that if we think of one form as dying, it's just that it's transforming. What it's transforming to, I have no idea. Thank you. <laughs> that was deep, wasn't it? <laughs> Does anyone feel like responding immediately to what anyone here has said? Or should we ask, go on to a... Yeah, yeah please, go ahead. About um, Fire and Fury, the, the yeah. Trump book, uh, you know, you, you look at some parts of that book and you look at CNN, you know, on a daily basis, and you look at the kind of news that's coming out of the White House, and you look at the kinds of lies that Trump says on a daily basis and the kinds of things that he says on a daily basis. And if you're a novelist, you think to yourself, of course, this applies to our government as well. Uh, and if you're a novelist, you think to yourself, how can, you, how can fiction ever compete with fact? That's right. As we see it today. Well, to that question, my response would be something Ezra Pound said a long, long time ago about poetry. He said, poetry is the news that stays news. That applies to literature. It applies to fiction as well. It will stay news long after Trump is a shameful dot or footnote in our human history. Wow. Okay, we can end the panel now. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's <laughs> it, Pat. <laughs> Listen, uh, uh, I know some people live stream uh, the panels here. Uh, I have already missed the first day of my semester, so don't do any of that because my dean might be watching. Uh, but tied to my goals, there is everyone in my class is reading Reality Hunger by David Shields, which is a manifesto. Many of my friends don't like the book, but it is a manifesto for new writing in the sense that it says conventional plots, conventional fiction doesn't work. We are in the realm where news, reportage, perhaps more than fiction, as fiction works. I wonder whether any of you have any strong positions. Um, oh, I'm sure there are many of us who have strong <laughs> positions. <laughs> no, the, the trouble with the David Shields book and the trouble with, uh, my first book 20 years ago was reportage and news clips and so on. But again, it's just this is one segment. The idea that this could be the, what the novel is as opposed to uh, what she was talking about, which is an empathy f approach to, to writing, if we want to call it that, is, is just silly. It's it's, it, yeah. Novels come in all shapes and sizes, and the way we're getting is there's probably for every reader in here, there is a novel that works for them. To come in and say this is how it should be yeah. is just ridiculous. I I wanna, go, ahead. go ahead, please. I, I also, just, just to add, I think that um, Novelists often are born centrists, and what I mean by that is that in the form of the novel, they engage complexity rather than just sort of one take on reality. Um, by writing about a character who, who holds contradiction and has perhaps contradictory views of things, mm -hmm. we're able to probe both sides of the political spectrum and um, in, a, in a way engage dialogue more than the news does. Great, Josh. I would, I would uh, pick up on something that was said earlier about um, the novel being all sorts of things, right? I mean, the novel is a capacious form and it comes in all shapes and sizes and different subject matters and so forth. I would also say to the, the opposite of that, I suppose, would be that the novel is often confused for a lot of things. like. It's easy to confuse a bit of history for a novel, or mm -hmm. it's easy to confuse like sociological observation for the novel, or even you know one story. Um, you sit down and you're like, you know, finally I'm going to tell my story, and it's it's in the form of a novel for various reasons. You're not really sure why. You think it's the right move, and you start writing, and you adapt a persona. It's a different name, and in fact, you're just writing your story. And so maybe in you know, in fact, it should be 
you should use your real name and, and tell your story in a more forthright manner. The novel is so often confused for something else, or something else is confused for a novel, that it often makes for bad novels. And so I think actually one of the things that I try to do when I'm thinking about a new story or a new novel is really scrutinize the motives behind uh, that idea and say, should this, does this really belong in the world of fiction? Because ultimately a successful novel is going to succeed only in terms of its fiction and only in terms of its fictionality. So you can have a historical novel, but it's going to succeed first, not as history, but as a novel. And this, these are really hard things to discern, especially as you're riding along and you want to be, you want to be riding a novel. A novel is a kind of like, you know, Moby Dick, it's a white whale, it's a Himalayan peak, it's whatever, you know, it's an extraordinary thing that you want to accomplish, but it's also really hard and it's, it's very easy to confuse other things for it. I've shut us all down. <laughs> I've, I've quieted everyone. Pregnant pause. Kaya? I, I, I had the same difficulties that you were describing about um, where to locate the heart of the novel that I was working on because it's a novel about Joseph Conrad and his relationship with his agent, his literary agent, who lived for a while in Istanbul uh, at the end of 19th century. So you come across some material and you say, okay, this is gold. I've come across gold and it's going to be great. I can build a novel on this. This is an interesting story there. Uh, but then you have to find the fictional heart of it and that's the difficult uh, part. And if your departure point is history or some curious incident, uh, in, in the pages of a history book, then you, you, I think it takes longer to find that uh, fictional heart. Yeah. Uh, but if you begin with the whale and then you build the whole history and all the story around it, but you have to f first begin with the whale and the, the central image and the, perhaps the non-fiction bits should come later. I mean, fiction is almost uniquely useless. It's only useful for conveying, you know, what fiction conveys best. I suppose that could be diagnosed. You could talk about empathy. You could talk about delight. You could talk about aesthetic delight, the poetry of language. These things are being conveyed in any successful novel. But as a use, you know, it, it doesn't have what history has in terms of edification and enlightenment. It doesn't really have some of the other, you know, useful things that other um, disciplines convey so well. Like when we look at Bartleby, for example, it's a narrative of office life, but uh, there was another book about office life in the US called Cubed. Uh, and or, it, and uh, then we came to the end? Almost, uh, almost <laughs> reads like a novel, and, uh, but it's a piece of uh, cultural history. Yeah. And when you look at uh, the Melville book, uh, it is about perhaps a situation, it's about yeah. a certain uh, tension yeah. rather than the office life yeah. itself. Yeah. yeah, just to come back to this idea of um, what makes a story a novel, and it's a really important question and it's one that I've struggled with because I'm constantly exposed through my research to incredible cases, incredible anecdotes, in, um, these individuals that I find really interesting, and I could write, I could write about all of them but the ones that kind of take hold of me are the ones that maybe um, it's the kernel around something else growing, something else grows around it. And if I think back to the history I studied at university, I don't remember much of what I was taught, but the things I do remember are these um, particular cases. There was one of a woman during the Reformation in England, um, a peasant woman who managed to save enough money to buy an English Bible that she couldn't read and she would have someone read it to her. And for that, she was um, declared a heretic and burned. So why have I remembered that out of all of the different important historical political moments that I studied? It's because I could, I could, I could feel her. I could see a soul. I could see um, a presence within the history. And that's what, I'm, that's what my novels are for. It's the other way around. They're novels which are showing some history, but you're really trying to capture a human soul in motion 
in time. Where the intersection between the personal and the historical, let's Yeah, say. and the political, the economic, everything. Everything, when you, the, the books, the his, historical books that I'm reading right now are people like Anthony Beaver who, who aggregates all of these incredible anecdotes and that brings together, that brings to life um, the, the takeover of Berlin by Russian troops or the battle for Stalingrad. But I'm not reading it for um, the generals, the, the, the politicians. I'm only reading it for the individuals, the, the ordinary people who otherwise you'd never find. Hmm. Various people have said that the Book of Chocolate Saints is about history too, in a sense, a certain time, a certain forgotten period of literary history in Bombay and poets. So you're doing that and something more, would you say that? And what is that that you're doing in the book? Well, that's one of maybe three or four things that, the, that this Fiction novel is trying to yeah, do, yeah. yeah. What is um, it? Well, uh, that, the section that you're talking about, which is an oral history section about uh, the Bombay poets of the 70s, 80s, and 90s, uh, is a kind of uh, a, a way of using the techniques and the tools of journalism and nonfiction in fiction. Uh, so a lot of... I was a journalist for 20 years before, 23 years before writing my first novel and the only way of uh, consoling myself about that wasted time is by telling myself that some of the things that I learned in those two decades uh, show themselves in uh, the, the enterprise of fiction. So a lot of the stories, um, the details, the the character sketches in, in that section, it's about 100 pages um, broken into three bits, uh, are absolutely factual and true. And, you know, what you were saying about novels being uh, uniquely useful. not useful, uh, I don't think that's true because with, there are certain novels that you can look at them. For example, Tolstoy. For example, Marquez. Uh, you can look at them and in a sociological way or an anthropological way, way, you could delineate how a particular society lived, how a, a, a small village in the middle of nowhere uh, faced a century of history and how, how the, the modern world arrived in that little village. You could actually use it like an anthropological study. And I think that is the great use of fiction because you can also learn, as you're learning how a people lived and died, and what they dreamed of and what they worried about, you can also come across, perhaps, um, at the risk of sounding like a fetishist, you can come across a beautiful sentence or an image. I wouldn't disagree. I mean, I, I, would, I would agree that the, what marks those books that you've named, like Mar Marquez, you, you've got in there such extraordinary depths and layers that that does get conveyed, like the sociological breakdown and how, how an entire community or how an entire city lived um, does get conveyed. But, you know, I don't go to that for that information. I go to that for the delight of those sentences, for the unique take on the world by that particular individual. So, you know, what I really meant by its uselessness is that I am not seeking information. You know, if you think of, if you think of the, the, the way in which information gets built up. There's information at the bottom layer, and then there's something that we might call knowledge up top of that, and then you might think of wisdom uh, above knowledge. I think that a great novel that's using all of its uh, potential is hitting those three uh, layers of sophistication constantly and fluctuating back and forth between them. So that, you know, uh, information is crucial to it, but information can also be manipulated in such a way that in a novel, you understand that it can't be extracted and presented as the truth. So, you know, the novel has a very complicated relationship with the truth, with facts, um, with data. Uh, and it's the thing that makes it uniquely human and I think distinguish it, distinguishes itself from what we're always seeking on our phones, which is the basic information. Which might not be true either. Which, yeah. Which might also not be true. And why it's so important to become a fiction writer and to be a fiction writer, because then you are so much more adept at, at discerning between what is fact and what is not fi what is fact and what is fiction in a world that is supposed to be entirely factual. Yeah. So Maybe. I suppose that's a use. 
You know, that's a, like a usefulness of, of fiction. It allows you to interpret reality a little better. Well, as, at a time when reality is increasingly difficult to interpret, and you know, when you think about fake news, at least fiction calls itself fiction. There's yeah. a, right. There are two right. words on the cover right. that says mm -hmm. a novel. Ravi is signed. Do you have some uh, views I, to share? Can I, You're touching. Can I throw the gauntlet and say it is probably, I don't know if it's the most useless thing, but it certainly is useless. Uh, like all art, it is useless. Uh, the I don't think that's true. I, well, let, let me finish and then you okay. can argue with me. We could have a duke it out. <laughs> it is both, I mean, I've, I've said it before, writing a novel, a great novel, is one of you know, man's greatest achievement and it's also one of the most useless things. They're both at the same time. Useless and necessary at the same time. Mm -hmm. Exactly. The, right. I, I, be able to, diff but we, we create, we are the ones who give it importance. Uh, I, as a reader, give novels importance. Uh, but I could get, I mean, for me, if, the, if uh, Proust was so important, we would not have elected Trump. Okay. That's if, a great line. Yeah. If Proust was I hope it's so reported important. in the Times of India tomorrow. Yeah. Yes. So that the whole idea of going, that. like, oh if, my God, <laughs> this is life changing. It is not life changing. You know, books are for those of us who love them, a way of communicating, a way of being moved, which is great. But the truth is, we affect nothing. But that's like saying love is. Oh, is I, not let, let me, let me, let me. <laughs> love is completely unimportant. <laughs> okay. But okay, it, I'll do, can I do my counter argument? Yes, 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 please. please. Um, I'm from Somalia. Now it's a, it's, a, it's a state called Somaliland, which no one recognizes. It's a fiction of its own. It's a country that's a fiction. And there's only now a growing literary culture. It went from having very, very, very few novels to now having a few novels. And that, that paucity is a tragedy. You've had all of these massive events back to back, a dictatorship, a civil war, a new state, all of the things that went on before that in, in the 19th century, in the early 20th century. And they haven't been reflected on. Everything has been moved on, moved on. People have tried to build themselves from the ground up each time. Um, as children, as each generation has grown, they try to reform the state. And if you had novelists or a chain of, um, you, ha you have poetry in Somaliland, you do have poetry, but it's an oral and dynamic tradition. So you don't have an accurate portrayal of how someone like my great grandmother would have felt and experienced certain events, or my great grandfather. And we're now trying to fill in those, like, those holes. And that's why I think I feel a, a big responsibility to tell the truth in my fiction. Mm -hmm. Because I know that both Somali readers and non-Somali readers will be taking my book as, as, a, as an anthropological work, almost. Um, as evidence that you existed. Yes. Or that this was yeah. once here. Yes. That has been erased now. Um, and much of the work, uh, much of the writing by Somali women is actually ghost-written. So when it comes to non-fiction, people like Ayan Hirsi Ali, um, uh, what's her name? What is, what is Stiri? What's uh, No, she's a poet and yeah. I love her. But much of the non-fiction is ghost-written and tells a very repetitive story of almost salvation from ah, Somali life yeah. and Somali culture. And that has quite a negative impact on the lives of Somali women. You know, one of the things I should quickly mention is that this panel came about because John Freeman edits a journal to which he has given the name Freeman's, and it had a special issue on new writing. If I, you know, I have left it at home, I didn't know that I was supposed to perform this task, but I think both of you contributed to that issue? I have. Yeah, and your piece, the one on Grenfell Towers, on the, in the collapse, was that one in it, or? No, there's a piece of fiction in it, so okay. there's an extract from my um, third novel, which isn't published yet. Yes, yes. And that Which is supposed to be amazing, by the way. Yes. <laughs> I hope it is. It's, uh, it's very, very, very historical. So I've actually put... It's based on a real-life character, Mahmoud Matan, who was a sailor, a victim of a miscarriage of justice in Britain in 1952. So I've been reading the case notes, the court transcripts, the, the medical records, everything. And I've wanted it to, to be imperceptible, whether it's fiction or non-fiction. The line is completely blurred now. I would like you to just speak a little bit about what you were trying to accomplish also in non-fiction when you were talking about the collapse of the Grenfell Towers and about immigrant life 
and then use mm. non-fiction then to come back to the issue you raised, Charmaine, about autofiction, just to see why, is that really a dominant trend in new writing, etc. So that's the track we are going okay. to take. Would I, you talk I, a I'm, I'm sure most of you have heard about what happened in West London in the summer. June 14th, there was a massive fire in a tower block um, in Latimer Road. And I, I heard about it on Facebook in the middle of the night, and I didn't take it seriously. I thought, oh, everyone will be evacuated, it'll be fine. And we woke up to images of the whole tower ablaze. And at the time, we didn't know if hundreds of people were missing, but now the, the death toll is 40, 71, 71, and many people injured. So I was concerned that I might have known people in the tower. I used to volunteer in the area. I went there the morning after, and um, there was this huge effort to bring supplies of all sorts of different types, and there was very little information, and it was this very eerie, strange time, the, the strangest time I've experienced in London. So I think the fire encapsulated a lot of things that I've been thinking and feeling in a shapeless way about the inequality that you see, and it's growing in London, and it's growing in New York, and it's growing in many places, that in London, people live, very, very wealthy people and very, very poor people live right next to each other, but they, they don't interact in any way. And there's a sense of apartheid, especially in the part of West London, where uh, Grenfell Tower was. So it's a very political event, it's a very upsetting event, and it's, it's, it's made me understand the things that I've been thinking and feeling in a shapeless way. And as a writer, you have to be engaged. You have to be engaged. I'm one of the few writers from um, an immigrant, working class background in the UK. It's a very, I think, wealthy and um, sometimes very insular world otherwise. So I, I do want to bring another voice. I do want to bring another understanding. I have family that live in tower blocks like this. This isn't, this isn't some strange place that, um, that is never written about. I want to write about these kind of environments. Yeah. I think, you know, fiction... Novels have always incorporated both the world, you know, what we call non-fiction, and the imaginative. Cool? But it is my understanding, or my prejudice, that in that the new writing, there is a leaning toward non-fiction. That's A. B, there's this part that you called autofiction in your opening remarks. Can you tell the audience, what is autofiction? And why do you see that as playing an increasing part in what it could, we could call new writing? So very simply, and please correct me if you think I'm wrong, anyone else on the, on the stage here, but autofiction tends to be fiction that's um, narrated in first person by a narrator who bears a strong resemblance to the author, uh, him or herself, themselves. Um, even perhaps has that author's name uh, many of the features of the, the narrator's life is similar to the author's life. Yeah. Um, and I, I, just to get the ball rolling on the conversation, I, I feel that it's probably come out of the spirit in our times of sort of the tyranny of the self that we see represented in social media. Um, uh, and also the tyranny of our moment. So there's generally in literature a bias against historical fiction. And I'm a, my first two novels are works of historical fiction as well. Um, there is a sense that, that we must always be making progress, moving forward, discussing ourselves, rather than necessarily deriving lessons from the past. So it's a sort of um, ultimate manifestation of egoism. I think that's not to say that I haven't really respected many works of autofiction. In fact, I've, I've, I've really... Um, Loved a number of works, Rachel Cusk or um, Ben Lerner. Yeah. Uh, Some of your best friends are uh, writers <laughs> of autofiction. Actually, yes, 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 yes. Some comments responding to uh, Charmaine's uh, description? I think uh, last summer, I remember on Saturday Review on BBC, they were discussing Elif Potoman's book, The Idiot. And I think it's a, a perfect example of autofiction. And uh, one of the critics said, but it's, that's not fiction, that's just her life at Harvard. That's just a narrative of her own experiences. And then I was really annoyed by that comment because I remembered the reception of Knausgaard, for example, yeah. and how he was seen as this kind of Christian uh, narrator. It, it almost seemed as if it was allowed for male writers to write about their 
recollections and remembrances of things past. But yeah. if you're a woman, female writer, it's like, it's not how you write a novel. This is just your I absolutely agree autobiography. With you. There's and a strong prejudice against women doing it. I think yeah. if you write in a very, about your domestic life, which I never do, I think that a woman is taken much less seriously than a man is. Um, and I, I have a strong prejudice against autofiction, I think, mm. unless it's telling a story that I really haven't heard before. I find it very repetitive. I, I'm not interested in a writer writing about a writing retreat. There's very little, I think, that you can empathize with or even, where's the drama? Where's the structure? Where's, where are all of these other things that I, I look for in a novel? Well, um, can I say one thing? Because anybody who describes that as Proustian has not read Proust. There's no way. Uh, but uh, I write in first person, um, five novels. Well, the first person is an autofiction. Exactly. That, that, it's just, I'm too boring to actually write about myself. So. <laughs> no, you're not. Mr. Ferris, here's another, fiction, here's yay or another nay. interesting way to think about the difference between fiction writer and a nonfiction writer. I think that the nonfiction writer is always uh, working hard for the reader to come up and say something like, oh my god, I can't believe that that actually happened. And the fiction writer is always endeavoring to make the reader come up and say, oh my god, I can't believe that that didn't happen. Hmm. So there's a distinction between, there's a lot to be said for that distinction in terms of what the motives are. The motives of a nonfiction are to convey to you an extraordinary event that you may not have known about or that is conveyed in such a convincing way that you are blown away anew. And the fiction writer is trying to say something like, you know, this might not have, ha have happened, but I'm going to convey as, as much reality in the direction of it that, that you would be able to, not be able to distinguish between, you know, it's not actually happening and it's happening. So, you know, with autofiction, the thing that happens is that the, those two things get blurred, the line gets blurred. And while there are, ha, have been mentioned really great examples of the success of that, the, the likelihood of failure is, I think, much greater. It's, you know, you can fall into solipsism, you can fall into a kind of, um, you know, uh, vacuum of self that doesn't convey um, any of the magic that the, that the novel can. And the, and the distinction of fiction is really um, that it's mediated by a narrator and thus gives us the opportunity to inhabit inner worlds of others. And it seems that auto-fiction is very distrustful of that empathic process. David right. Shields even, I think, says point blank, I'm going to paraphrase, but you know, it's, it's hubristic to think any of us can imagine our way into anyone else. And I think the novelist's position is, no, yeah. it's, it's the opposite of hubristic. It's, it's Hold a my sort beer. Of, yeah. <laughs> Here's another thing I'd like to add, if I could. Please. Um, there's a distinction between illusion and delusion. And I, I always said the definition between them would be best put like this. Uh, an illusion is the belief that I'm going to be the next president of the United States. It's not out of the realm of the possible, like I am over 40 and I'm a citizen and maybe, right? And so if I said this to my family, they could say, good luck, you know, go with God. But it would be complete delusion for me to say I'm going to be the first president of the United States. That's at the point where my, my family sends me into the psychiatric clinic. I think one of the things that happens in, in fiction is that it's not just an attempt to get down accurately what people's lives were like and what um, happened on such and such a date. It's also to try to capture as authentically and scientifically as possible people's illusions and delusions. And so fiction also takes in the realm of so much more than what we can possibly convey or convince people is factual. It takes into account dreams and aspirations. It takes into account you know, madnesses and illogic and, and irrationality. And the capturing of that is, so, is, is absolutely vital to our understanding of what it means to be a human being, that often nonfiction will elide because it doesn't actually have a document. It doesn't have proof for what those delusions could have been. <laughs> Can I say something? Uh, all this is both true, and again, it's limiting. Uh, I don't know what to define as autofiction. I suggest there's difference between good novels and bad novels. You know, uh, uh, Calvino never cared to, you know, show you illusions, or he did actually, 
but he didn't follow anything. He just followed his own thing, and they were great. Uh, you know, a, 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 I could see an autofiction, I mean, I can't think of anybody, but I could see that it would work, that anything can work as long as it's good. The idea that we can sit here and go, uh, this is the future of new fiction, or this is a novel, uh, let's just say it, it, it makes me feel uncomfortable. <laughs> I start going like, the stage is shaking, by the way, so I'm shaking with it. Uh, it makes me feel uncomfortable. It's like there are a lot of different kinds of writers who write all kinds of things, and to actually say that this is a novel that, and this is not a novel is, is troubling for me. I differentiate between good novels and bad novels, and there okay. are a hell of a lot of bad novels out there, and there's, you know, whichever way you write it, there are a hell of a lot more bad novels than there are good novels. We are coming to a time when we have to open the floor, but I want Jeet first to also uh, Just very, say something about autofiction. A very quick, uh, uh, since we're defining, um, I think one way to think of autofiction as opposed to fiction is, uh, think of autofiction as fiction with all the invention, the drama, the Take delight, and the ambition <laughs> taken out. <laughs> <laughs> That and the learning, you have to learn. I think writing a novel, I learn so much. I learn about things I never knew about. Jewish funeral rites, what it's like to be in an engine room of a steamship. That, to me, is the pleasure of writing. All right. This is time for call and response. Where's the microphone? Right in the front. <clears throat> Thank you. Well, that was a really fun panel, actually. Um, enjoyed it uh, very much. Didn't learn what new writing is, but never mind. I just had one uh, quick uh, comment as a, as a short story writer. I, uh, and uh, since this was geared around a journal that presumably doesn't publish novels but short pieces, everyone talked about the novel, um, no comments on, the, on shorter fiction. And in my opinion, I think short fiction has the same amount, although concisely, a, a flexibility and absorption to uh, and response to the times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Folks, who's going to comment on the we short could, we story? We could have or? talked about this. I mean, uh, we could have talked about poetry. We, the, the thing that happens is primarily most of us are novelists. You know, I've written one book of short story and it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Why does it suck? Uh, because it was, I was experimenting a lot. It was. It short fiction? Actually, no, except that the FBI did get involved. Uh, Someone from this side, maybe? Is there a hand up? The gentleman there in the fourth row? Uh, hi. I don't know if it is just me or many people in the room, but I feel like uh, the future of new writing was not discussed. Rather, the future of novels were discussed, and that too, fiction uh, categorized as fiction and nonfiction. But I want to understand uh, if, like Joshua also said, that uh, people are replacing novels with smartphones. If the medium is going to change and you are delivering as novelists the same message, how, is go how you are going to stay relevant along with time? When, when, when the media is changing, when the medium is changing and the message is same, how is it going to stay relevant? Well, there is a publisher in India that is now selling um, novels designed to be read on a phone. Juggernaut, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but also, I mean, the, to think that we are living in a special time is a little bit uh, too self-centered. Uh, the, the world has been changing, media has been changing for, you know, the last 150 years or whatever. You know, television came along, we thought the novel is dead. Movies came along, we thought the novel is dead. Uh, the novel has been dying for a long, 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 long time. <laughs> the lady in the second row. Thank you. I also really enjoyed your panel, and I enjoyed the discussion. Um, <clears throat> I have three kind of interlinked questions, or one question with three parts. Um, how would you define a novel? And I, I realize this is going to be entirely subjective. And then, what constitutes a good novel? And lastly... Um, how, where do you draw the line between journalism and novel writing? Because um, journalists research, do research and tell a story in a manner that's compelling and moving. And novelists presumably 
attempt to do the same thing. And journalists also often take lots of liberties, as we know. Um, so it's interesting for me to understand where that line between non-fiction and fiction is drawn today. And lastly, I wanted to um, agree oh with Nidifa. Oh my God, Nidifa. that's an epic okay, the so question. <laughs> last, last. <clears throat> um, just, I really want to agree with Nadifa because I don't believe that the novel is dead. And I think that the novel is a really useful tool for telling untold stories from, uh, and representing unheard voices from Somalia, from Palestine, from you know, women's voices over the generations telling history through the eyes of women. So I just want to, um, I wanted to agree with her and to okay. make that comment. Since I think Nadifa has been addressed, uh, her views will be prejudicial here, so uh, <laughs> you as the objective speaker must respond. No, in fact, I, I was thinking that the only way to respond to that uh, epic question... <laughs> Four-part question. Is, ...is by saying yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Take away. No, no, that's good. The young lady in the back row there. Hello, sirs. Uh, I've been uh, <laughs> sorry, oh. ma'am. Also, I've been uh, listening to the session ardently, and uh, I'm a literary student, literature student, and uh, I have been reading literature as it has been, and uh, of course, following the T.S. Eliot tradition, of course. Sir, uh, my question is, uh, in terms of non-fiction, that uh, uh, for everything we have come so far, uh, much and more has been written, uh, studied and read also. Uh, do you think there is a lack of newness in our world? And other thing also, sir, because uh, I am an uh, aspiring writer also, so I, I feel this myself. And second thing, for new writers, uh, like uh, older books, they have been uh, labeled as classics. Uh, we have many, many classics from uh, 19th, 18th, 17th centuries, 20th centuries. For new writers like me, or are coming to be, or like you, uh, there will be a lack of, uh, you know, you won't, be, you won't be able to get the tag of classics. We won't be classified as classics. That's my question, sir. Thank you. Someone wants to? I, I'm not sure I understood the question, but I, I was born a classic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a good answer. Um, just look. The the <laughs> I think there's been two questions which kind of sounded to me as if people are asking about um, how, how do we write novels right now? And I, we haven't quite answered it, I think. Okay. Okay. And to go back to the smartphones, I, I'm a genuine internet addict. I can be on the internet for 12 hours, just doing different things. Some, you know, I call it research, and then I'll be watching something on YouTube, and then blah, blah, blah. And it's really damaged my brain. My attention span got really low. I was kind of constantly jittery, and I could feel that something negative had happened. And I'm now trying to actively wean myself back off the internet. And novels are perfect for that. I, f I can feel my blood pressure going down. I can feel my concentration uh, improving. So I think it's kind of, smartphones are a new, exciting thing, but very, I think in no time at all, people will realize that this is an unhealthy thing. All right. This is something that we need to counteract in some way. Can I a answer the question about um, what the novel is? Okay. Yeah. A novel is a written document that's over 100 pages. All right, great. Thank you. Uh, I it, love it, the brevity of that answer. <laughs> I would like your questions to be also brief. Okay, so let me finish with this okay. one. Uh, good one is, Passes the, passes the test. Very good. Very and good. the difference between nonfiction and fiction is that fiction doesn't as, as, aspire to the truth. All or right. to being balanced. But. Yes. First, the gentleman with the specs, and then the lady with the blue highlights in her hair. Pehle pehle us taraf. You know, while this is the student back there used the word aspiring writer. I think JLF can be divided into two parts. In the audience sit many aspiring writers, on the stage sit the failed writers. <laughs> so, anyway, yes, boss. Uh, Joshua said that uh, fiction uh, essentially does not strive for the truth and we don't go there for information. Uh, when, when it comes to history, I suppose history doesn't give us the entire information either. So, uh, f consider a book like Delhi by Kushwan Singh. Uh, right, and I would suggest someone if they want to uh, get some information on daily, they should 
not just read a historical document, they should go to uh, Kushwan Singh's Delhi, read that, okay. and then they might get a. Do you agree to that? I don't know whether anyone here has read Delhi necessarily. Have you read Delhi by Kushwan Singh? Okay, so sorry we can't answer the question. The lady there? No, <laughs> no, the lady with the blue highlights had first told. We need, some, we, we need to have diversity in our questions and we need now a questioner with blue highlights in the hair. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it. Uh, I, as a writer of uh, a lot of different genres, um, I'm, I'm with Rabi in the sense that I don't want to say that one thing, one kind of writing is better than another or is less, uh, in, has less integrity. I wanted to push back a little bit with what Joshua was saying, with this idea of um, fiction aspiring to be something and nonfiction aspiring to some, something else. It sort of leaves out speculative fiction, for example. Um, or what Nadifa was talking about with these uh, internal um, books versus the ones that take on the larger um, questions, whether you can still learn something even if you are just looking at something smaller rather than something bigger. So those were the two things I wanted to ask you about. You know, in speculative fiction, it's often like, oh, I can't believe this world doesn't exist. Like, it's so well rendered and so well thought out and... and you're kind of, you know, sunk down into it in a f fully believing that it, um, that it exists. So I, I don't know. I mean, I, uh, I think it applies even there. I mean, okay. and that might not be what you're getting at. Go ahead. I want to say something? Yeah, um, I think I understand your question. And for me, it's never really just about the um, internal life of someone. That's, that's a big part of what I'm trying to write or how I write but I was speaking to someone about how I write and it's, it's about piecing together these different dots. So there might be an interesting person with an interesting incident in their life, that grabs my attention. Then there's probably something going on in the wider world that relates to that. And then I'll um, hear, overhear something on the bus or something like that and that will, that will add to it. And it becomes this kind of aggregation of both um, political, social things, uh, personal things, um, things that I'm interested in, artistic interests, but you're aiming for both longitude and latitude, longitude and latitude, and without that, that to me is when a novel feels incomplete, and that's where I think my, my prejudice towards autofiction comes from, is that very occasionally I'll be very interested in a book which is about someone's daily life where not much happens, but it just seems, it seems so insular to me to, to, to do that. Mm. We have time for one last question. Maybe that lady in yellow who was raising her hand. Yeah. Thank you for allowing me the privilege to ask you that question. Okay, ask the quick question. Though. It was really, um, I think, uh, important because I've just spent the last four months writing a book and I heard you guys talking about autofiction, wherein uh, you were speaking about a third person, right, writing the book. So this is a bit of a biography, you could say, based on a real life story. And it's been written in third person because uh, the protagonist and the author are the same person. And the author is not suffering from schizophrenia, but it's just that the situation of the story is such. So I just wanted to ask you that, um, like you said, there are some that have been written well and there are some that haven't. Would it be taking a chance, considering it's my first book, to be written in that manner? Thank you. I think the question yes. is for you. <laughs> she has written autofiction, do you think, for the first book? In the third book, person. In the third person, yeah. though. And do you think that's a risk, or will it work? Can you say that without reading the book? I think it's going to be a hit. Oh, excellent. <laughs> now, on that positive note, please thank our panelists. It's been a great session. All right. <laughs>